Uh, this is not the kind of thing I usually do. And uh, in fact, I'm told that I have to go out onto the middle of the stage rather than crouching behind this podium. So I'm going to do that. Let's watch. <laughs> so I've never done that before. <laughs> so I, I don't usually speak to tech conferences because I'm not a tech person. I'm an, I'm an author. And uh, we do have a somewhat different perspective. I, I love the enthusiasm for all of these new things uh, that has surrounded me so far at this conference. Uh, forgive me for not being quite as hopped up about it all as uh, some people <laughs> may be. <laughs> this is the publishing pie. Uh, and the publishing pie is the entire uh, business that surrounds uh, books. And um, we are all part of that, whether we're idealistic tech people or whether we are uh, scribblers, such as myself. Uh, so this is what we're all looking at and what we've all been talking about. Uh, is the industry dying? Uh, if it dies, will authors die too? And from the point of a view of an author, if uh, the future is the internet and if everything on the internet is potentially free, who is going to pay for the cheese sandwiches on which authors are known to subsist? And <laughs> to put that in perspective, only 10%, and this is a statistics from a couple of years ago, only 10% of authors make their living such as it is, uh, writing full time. And as I am one of those people, I can tell you that you have to work hard a lot. And uh, so that, that is the question that is facing us. Um, we have heard a certain amount of panic. And um, my first message to you is don't panic. Because if you do panic and run away, they will think you're a prey. I suppose this, <laughs> this is a message to my fellow authors. Don't panic yet. <laughs> oh, yes, stay calm. So what is publishing really? Uh, we've been talking a lot about infrastructure and technology and all of this kind of stuff. But what publishing really is, is, is it's making something public. And it's just the transmission, a mode of transmission of stuff from one brain into another brain. I uh, don't know whether you remember the movie Young Frankenstein in which there's a brain transfer at the end of the movie. It's done by a tube. Uh, so that is one method of brain transmission. And a book is another method of getting stuff from one brain into another brain. It doesn't necessarily have to be a book. There have been a lot of publishing tools one of them is yelling. That's, that's a very old one. <laughs> and then we've, we've gone through a number of others. Singing, you know, stories used to be sung. Clay tablets, problem, they melt in the rain. Uh, scrolls, some of you may remember scrolls. If you do remember them personally, I would like to talk to you later. <laughs> How you have managed to be alive for 2,000 years. Um, Codex books, they preceded um, the Gutenberg age, of course. Films and TV, graffiti, stuff you write on washroom walls, that's publishing too. Texting, letters, rude notes, and the internet. And just by the by, people are now finding out that, uh, inter that putting stuff on the internet and blogs and tweets is just as subject to libel suits as, as putting them in a book. So that is publishing, too, subject to the same kinds of strictures. So publishing tools are changing. And we've heard a lot about change. Change is not always good. <laughs> sorry, sorry to tell you that. <laughs> it's not always good for everyone. So we have to think about that, too. Change is not always good. And do we want uh, some of the changes we are bringing about? Have we thought about um, 
<laughs> uh, whether some of the changes are really good or not. Uh, every tool, and this does include every tool, including hammers, people say to me, well, are you against technology? And I say, technology is just a tool. And every tool has three sides. The sharp side or upside, the uh, dull side or downside, and the stupid side, which is, <laughs> which is the side you didn't anticipate uh, and didn't um, and whose consequences you did not intend. So that's the part you cut yourself with without intending to. And every tool also has that side. A hammer, for instance, you can build a house for the homeless with it, you can murder your neighbor. Uh, <laughs> or <laughs> Good side, the bad side, and the stupid side is the part where you hit your thumb. <laughs> For instance, the stupid side of paper books, no, I am not a trader. The stupid side of paper books includes, they do make good insulation, but they also make good kindling. They do get wet if you drop them in the bathtub. They are heavy. The stupid side of electronic information includes one big solar flare and it's gone. <laughs> There's something you really, really want to save and you think there's going to be a solar flare or an electromagnetic pulse of any kind, get yourself a lead-lined safe and put it in there if it's digital. Uh, put it, download it and put it in that safe, otherwise it's going to be gone. If the tech changes, you can't read it anymore. How many have had the floppy disk experience? <laughs> You didn't transcribe those floppy disks soon enough, did you? And now you have to pay a bazillion dollars if you want to retrieve what's on them. And uh, that goes for anything connected to any other company that supplies anything that you may need to access your information. Um, so there's one good thing about paper. When the lights go out, you will still be able to read that paper book with a candle. Think of that. Not that the lights are going to go out <laughs> all the time. <laughs> How will the change in publishing tools affect authors? Will their slice of the publishing pie become ever smaller, as is already happening with their percent of ebook sales? The Authors Guild did an analysis of this a little while ago. You can find it online. Um, authors actually make less per, uh, less of the sale price with ebooks than they do with paper books. Um, as ebooks replace paper books, that means the slice of the author's pie is, is shrinking. Uh, and will the author's cheese sandwich supply dwindle away? such as that there are no more cheese sandwiches left for the author to live on. Helpful industry hint, never eliminate your primary source. This is, a <laughs> this is an example from biology. <laughs> it is a dead moose. <laughs> Every dead moose uh, maintains um, the food chain for at least 30 other life forms. I have drawn here only a few of them. We have, <laughs> we have the mice, we have the insect world, we have the uh, scavengers uh, of both the mammalian and the avian kind, but there are actually a lot of them that live off the dead moose. This is a dead author. <laughs> the author is, is a primary source. Everything else in the world of publishing depends on authors. They don't have to be dead, although dead ones have been very lucrative. A <laughs> couple of reasons. <laughs> Once they're out of copyright, the material is free. <laughs> number one. And number two, if they're famous, you can keep recirculating them in various guises over and over again, just like the dead moose. 
so authors are a private uh, primary source. They sustain many other life forms. Uh, in the little biological food cycle of publishing. If you can't read my writing, it's the author plus the book, the bookseller, the agent, the, the school, the printer, the reviewer, the college, the publisher, the editor, and the librarian, and those are just the ones that I could think of. Uh, we could all, include all of these e-publishing people and designers and cover designers and, and uh, text designers and all of, those, all of those other people who fool around with, with books. Uh, no author, no book. Think about it. <laughs> How do authors buy the time to do their writing? These are the traditional methods. One, <laughs> patrons, dukes, popes, and uh, nowadays grants. Two, day jobs. A lot of people have done those, T.S. Eliot and William Carlos Williams among them, and that includes teaching creative writing. Three, inheriting money. I recommend this. Do it, <laughs> Do it if you can. <laughs> Four, marrying somebody rich, <laughs> having a working spouse or indulgent parents. Five, ah, the serious business. Through copyrights. Either selling the copyright to a publisher for a flat fee, which is why Ellen Montgomery never made uh, much of a bean out of Anne of Green Gable. She had sold the copyright for a flat fee. Or licensing the copyright to a publisher for a royalty. The amount you make uh, then depends on how many copies you sell. It was suggested to me recently, in fact, it's been suggested by a couple of much younger people, that um, maybe writers should go the way of rock bands and make their primary money out of putting on shows and selling t-shirts. I will ask you the following question. How many writers would you pay, I mean more than once, to see uh, them take off most of their clothes, uh, paint themselves gold, and parade around on the stage with a big egg? <laughs> How many? <laughs> it would not be a pretty sight. <laughs> many authors began by self-publishing. 1946, comic book. The author is me. <laughs> I am uh, at this point six years old, and a lot of us got into books that way. First we made the book. And we made the technology, we sewed up the spine, and then we realized we had to write something in it. Um, it is a motivator. Some then went on to handset their first books on a flatbed press and make the cover using line blocks. The author again is me. This is my first book of poetry. I made 220 copies. I wish I'd made more. I wish I'd kept more. Go online and see what that is worth today. Makes me feel ill. <laughs> we then went on to save money. We designed our own covers. I did this one using Letraset and uh, Legal Dots, um, a recommended method. It's very cheap, 1966. Uh, we got our own photos taken uh, by our pals, and we sewed our own fur hats. <laughs> And that is the fur coat from the Sally Ann. It cost 25 bucks in 1969, the year in which I did my very first book signing in the men's sock and underwear department of the Hudson's Bay Company in Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> Who put it there? I, I, scared, <laughs> I scared a lot of men. The, um, <laughs> the title was The Edible Woman. They, uh, <laughs> came in at lunchtime to get their jockey shorts, took one look at me, and ran the other way. I sold two copies. copies. It's an early lesson in marketing. <laughs> we, we used uh, covers by our pals for the book covers. Again, really cheap. Here is the edible woman that made them run in, in the other direction. And then we went on to, in the early days of children's books in Canada, hand letter the text and draw the pictures ourselves because it was cheaper. And it was, it was so rudimentary in those days that they could only afford two-color printing, 
which is why the colors are so peculiar. I chose uh, red and blue. There is no black, and that's how you get that funny shade of brown. So finally, we <laughs> ended up building an international reputation. <laughs> this happens to be the moment when the wall came down in Eastern Europe and porn flooded in. So legitimate literary publishers didn't know what to do, and they did things like this. There were a lot of disappointed men in raincoats uh, <laughs> in Latvia. <laughs> But could a young writer today follow that sort of path? When mass printing first struck the world, the printer, the publisher, and the bookseller were one. So there are only two pie pieces, the PPB combo and the author. As publishing grew, the printer, publisher, and bookseller separated. Agents were added. Now there were five pie pieces at a minimum. The model developed in the 19th century and in the 20th gave the author a share of the publishing pie. So author plus agent, 5 to 15 percent, all others combined, 95 to 85 percent. Can the primary source, <laughs> author and book, sustain all those hungry mouths? Uh, credit to Joy of Cooking. <laughs> Once authors wrote and publishers made public. Now authors are under more and more pressure to do their own publicity. If you cannot read my handwriting, it says, the joy of accounting. <laughs> a fiction in it, never mind. Some people like it. <laughs> this is what authors are now told they must do. You have to make an electronic manuscript version for the publisher. Tour, sign, tweet, blog, Facebook, caper about in public, <laughs> and more. What would the great modernists have said? Proust, Wolf, Joyce. They are saying, <laughs> how vulgar. And no, I say no, I say no. <laughs> the added workload is causing unrest among the primary sources. Is the old model still viable for authors? If they're expected to do all of this other work, shouldn't they get more of the pie? Will they go back to self-publishing with all the tools that we've heard about uh, at this conference? Here is a recent story. It is Mark Jeffrey. I'm giving him a special shout out here because it is due to him ultimately that I am here. He happens to know Kat Meyer uh, and they talked me into it. This is his young adult novel. Here's how he got it published. He gave away 2.4 million free uh, podcasts uh, on the internet. And he self-published a hardback on Lulu. He sold it as an app in the iTunes store. Publishers finally noticed, and he got a paper publishing deal. It's coming out in May. OK, is this going to be the model? It's backwards from what we thought the model was. Write the book, get it published as a paper book, and then all this other stuff happens. He did it the other way around. What if I just want to write? <laughs> Am I doomed? Whatever the publishing and publicizing tools available, the author's problems remain. How do I pay for writing time? How can I get published? How to get the book to the ideal reader? Will there be enough cheese sandwiches? And do I have to become an alcoholic? <laughs> I used to feel that I was deficient because I wasn't one, but uh, that era has passed. <laughs> and for author and publisher both, with infinite choice for readers and the internet filled to bursting, how to draw attention to a single book. This has been a publishing problem for a long, long time. Will some pieces of the pie join together again? If so, which pieces? And what will be subsumed? Will booksellers and e-tailers become publishers? That's already happening. Will print on demand allow successful self-publishing and eliminate costs like storage and overruns? Will some books appear online first? That's already happening. Or in serial form like Charles Dickens? That's already happening. Will authors band together to form their own publishing ventures like United Artists? That's already happening in a small way. I just learned 
uh, two days ago. Still, note that in an age of remote and virtual, there's a craving for real and authentic. The age of relics is not yet over. If you can't read my writing, one of them is saying, I've got Elvis's shoelace. The other one is saying, oh yeah, well, I've got Jimi Hendrix's thyroid gland. <laughs> Don't discount it. <laughs> for instance, many of these slides were drawn by the author using a Sharpie, colored pencils, and a camera. <laughs> Paper, pens, pencils, camera, and PowerPoint were the publishing tools. How much are these images worth online? Nothing. They're copies like all other online images. What about the paper originals of the drawings? <laughs> and what if they're signed? <laughs> Questions? Yes. We've, we've got time yeah. for a couple of questions if you want to line up at the mics and if you want to just shout, I can repeat your question uh, into this thing on down here, the microphone. The mics are in the center and two center aisles in the first section. If not, just wave your hand. Wave, wave, wave. I've been asked everything. You don't have to be shy. Hello. Hi, um, what was the United Artists type organization and do you think that is a way that it's going to go? Okay, the United Artists, as, as you may remember, was a number of film stars, including Mary Pickford, who uh, realized that the studio was making a lot more money from them than they were, and they banded together and formed their own production company. And I did write down the name of the, of the person who has already formed such a group, and I'll put it up on my next blog post, but I don't have it in my mind right now. But I've heard this proposed by a number of people already. So it's in the air, and uh, I think it's, it's, being, um, it's being propelled by authors feeling that uh, publishers are being intransigent, and, uh, intransigent around the subject of, of e-book share. And it's not all publishers, but it is enough of them to cause the stirring among the, uh, what I call the anchovies of the food chain. Um, authors are individually small and weak, but, but en masse they feed publishing, and that's why I think of them as anchovies. Um, the anchovies are restless. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you for doing that. Um, would you describe what your vision would be of an ideal relationship between a publisher and an author in this new emerging publishing world? Do you mean an ideal relationship or something that might actually happen? Um, g give us both versions. <laughs> I want the ideal, actually. Oh, the ideal one. Well, now that, that would get pretty silly. Um, but they do some of that already. I mean, one, one of the things that, okay, let, let's say what a good editor can do for an author. Number one, encouragement. And authors are often quite insecure and, um, except for myself, um, neurotic. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they do need encouragement and, and uh, it's, it's good to have somebody at a distance, like not a family member. Uh, giving that encouragement and validation. Number two, a publisher with a reputable name does give an imprimatur if they publish it. So if they've thought it was worthy of publication, then there must be something in it. This isn't always true, but it is what people think. Uh, number th three, they can give guidance. Um, a good uh, copy editor, line editor will catch your uh, in, uh, unintentional mistakes. For instance, in Oryx and Crank, I had uh, Jimmy set out with um, five chocolate bars, and he ate one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. And uh, my editor said to me, you've either got to give him one more chocolate bar or have him eat one fewer. So things like that. Your readers will find those things. 
It's amazing what they will find. So catching the unintentional mistakes. I, I wrote a thing uh, a while ago called The Rocky Road to Paper Heaven, in which it points out some of the things that editors can do for you. Uh, but the message to publishers is, those editors are for hire out there in the wide, wide world. Uh, somebody told me 5,000 of them had got fired in the recent meltdown. So there are trained editors out there uh, that if you wanted to do the United Artists model, you could just hire them. Um, so publishers, and then what they used to do was publicize the book, take out ads, uh, plan a promo tour for you, and do all those sorts of things. And they are still doing that, but not as much as they used to do. So in an ideal world, of course, it would be uh, telling you you're wonderful every day. I'm not sure I could stand that. Um, OK, so I remove that. It's not ideal. But those are the, some of the kinds of things. Um, what's likely to happen, I really can't make any predict predictions. But as the gentleman before me said, everything's in motion. And uh, one of the things that is in motion is authors, their expectations, and their ways of doing things. Hi. Can you give us an update on that amazing signing at home thingy me jig that <laughs> did something else on the other side of the, of yes. the world yes. that you invented? Yes. Uh, I would love to give you an update. I'm not quite ready to do that. Uh, but ask me again in about uh, three months, I would say. Let us just say that that's another of the things that is in motion. And it has several different incarnations that are not unrelated to what we've been talking about here at this conference. Yes, it was amazing. You're talking about the long pen, and it was a way, before there were e-books, of making, um, basically it was a beam me up Scotty thing in which so, uh, so, writing got disassembled at one end, flew through the air, and got reassembled as real pen and ink writing at the other end. And that is good for a number of things, and not all of them are books. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the talk. So I'm both a publisher and a published uh, author. I'd like to know, how do you feel about a world that allows for self-publishing? Are you worried that uh, you know, the general quality might sort of, with everybody writing, the, the, the quality of uh, literary output now becomes uh, you know, questionable, or you know, it, it might compromise yes. the, uh, things. The quality of literary output has always been questionable. <laughs> people forget that. Uh, but having, in a previous life, been a Victorianist, uh, I refer you to penny dreadfuls and shockers and the kind of, um, as soon as people uh, in large numbers became literate and able to read, all of the sorts of things that parents deplore uh, immediately appeared. So that's been around for a long time. You go back and look at the history of pulp magazines, comic books, the, the attempts always to keep the lid on and not, and not to have them become t too uh, hor horripilating. Uh, but that, that has never ultimately worked. It, it moves somewhere else. And um, so that's, that's not an issue. The problem always is, and it's, it's, just as, it's, it's a huge problem for, problem for a self-published author. How do you get anybody to even know about your book, let alone read it? So some kind of sorting uh, is always going to take place. And we're hearing about more and more of these sorting schemes because we are overwhelmed with the number of, of things that we could read. So book blogs, um, there's now a subscription. The, the Book of the Month Club has kind of been reinvented as a subscription, uh, subscription services that tell you what you might like to read. So it's, it's a huge problem for self-published authors. And, and it, it's just del delusional to think that you can self-publish a book and then get, get on Twitter, and then everybody will buy your book. And it's just, that doesn't happen. It ha occasionally, it happens the way I, I showed in the Mark Jeffrey story. But, but that took a lot of work on his part. Yes. Hi, you had the slide about what the publishers tell the authors they need to do for marketing. Yeah. At what point do you say, this is what I can do as an author, so I can still provide my book so that you have a primary source? You know what they say about drugs, just say no. Um, <laughs> if, you, 
If it's something that you as an author cannot do, uh, or that you don't feel comfortable doing, or that you know you're actively bad at doing, it's probably counterproductive to try to do it. Um, and a lot of authors just don't want to do the, the stuff. They don't feel comfortable. They don't want to. Uh, they feel very uneasy. They, they will go to writer's festivals and things like that, but if you told them they had to have an active Facebook account, they would just say, no, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't want to. I can't. I, I don't know how to do it. I, I would be bad at it. And, and that's quite a lot true in many cases. So it is a dilemma. The, the publisher should be doing the publicity, but oft times they don't have the resources or they don't quite know how. They have for years been sending you these questionnaires saying basically who's your three best friends in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, uh, stuff like that. But you know, you, you're always at a loss trying to fill these things out because the thing about books and readers is you don't know who your readers are. There are ways of thinking you can find out and we've heard about those, but you still don't know. Okay, we've got um, five. Last question, please wrap. Yeah, see, they're telling me what to do. <laughs> yes, last question, please wrap. Here comes last question, please wrap. <laughs> uh, Margaret, thank you very much. It was lovely. Um, do you read ebooks and do you have an ebook reader? I've got two ebook readers and I read ebooks uh, on planes. That's where I read them. And sometimes in hotel rooms when the alternative is watching TV. Uh, so, so yes, I do. I, I think, and I did a blog post a while ago. I think it was last year, in which in which I we examined the reasons for keeping paper books, including the solar flares. And there was a long string of comments. And I would say I'm about in the middle of the bell curve. Some people said you are a luddite uh, unless you like E. And other people said I will never give up my sumptuous uh, paper book, the cover of which I love to stroke. And. <laughs> I'm in the middle. So I would say I'm a representative person. I want to have both choices. And I think I'm, I am one of those people who think that, that e-devices are actually increasing reading, although they are not increasing what the author makes per sale. So that is, that is the dilemma that authors face. Do you want lots of people reading your book or do you want a cheese sandwich? And if you <laughs> If you don't have lots of people reading your book, is that going to negate the cheese sandwich anyway? So with those final words, thank you very much. It's been lots of fun.